If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Rose. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 242 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be a maximum fun episode, classic for the ages. I have Hal Lublin and Mark Gagliardi with me, hosts of We Got This with Mark and Hal, an awesome podcast. So awesome. They had me as a guest, so you know it must be awesome. I'm on episode 429. We debate best TV car. That's what their podcast is all about. Over 400 episodes of small debates that are big deals to all of us. We'll get into that in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, I just want to remind everyone of last week's awesome interviews. Joel Thurm, legendary Hollywood casting director. He casted Airplane, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Taxi, Grease, a million stories there. And Emilio Plame joined me last week as well to talk about his movie, Nights of Swing. And we dove into his background. Two great interviews right there. And we got two great interviews right here in one. One episode Two great interviews, Hal Lublin and Mark Gagliardi. We're going to talk about their improv background, their voiceover acting, drunk history on Comedy Central, Gary Busey, Pet Judge. This episode has it all. Let's get right to it. Enjoy. All right. I'm excited to introduce my two guests, the co-hosts of We Got This with Mark and Hal. First up, actor, podcaster, improviser. Loved him in The Thrilling Adventure Hour, The Venture Brothers. The uh, welcome to the show, Hal Lublin. Lubs. Hi. I'll insert uh, applause. <laughs> and my second guest, <laughs> and my second guest, you loved him on the PBS series Amigos. <laughs> he can recite all 45 American presidents in <laughs> order. <laughs> he was the original frequent narrator of Comedy Central's Drunk History, star of Blood and Treasure. Welcome to the show. Mark Gagliardi. Hello. It is great to be here. I did a spit take almost when you said amigos because I had just taken a big sip of water. I did that when I was nine years old. So that was you. You start at the beginning and I love it. Well, that <laughs> mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. I love your podcast, by the way. It's thank you. It's amazing. Well, and we'll, we'll work up to the podcast. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. So as I look at both your careers, there's couple crossovers. One in particular that just, I think I need to spend a lot more time with was Gary Busey, Pet Judge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hal, you want to talk about Gary Busey, Pet Judge? Yeah. Like you're not supposed to work with animals, right? Don't work with kids and animals. And then this is just Gary Busey with animals, but the animals were the easy part. So <sighs> it was all improvised. It was a, it was a series that I think is still available on Amazon Prime. Yeah. He is a judge and it's all of these made up pet cases. All of us are improvisers. And so I was on it opposite our Thrilling Adventure Hour castmate, Annie Savage, who I've been performing with for 22 years. So that part was easy, but they're like, Gary can't hear. You have to be, a, you have to be really loud. So just everything you said, he's like, what? Say what again? Say who? It was just the most bizarre experience. And I wasn't sure if anything registered with him. And then when we were done, I still wasn't sure if anything registered with him. It was like, I, I would have done it just for the story alone to have seen, like, it just, it's, it was so bizarre. What was your experience like, Mark? Because we weren't there the same day. No, we were there on different days. Forgive me, I forget my partner's name on it. She was a brilliant improviser. It was the only time I ever worked with her. I had a great time doing it. I thought Gary Busey scared the hell out of me at one point, though. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Charlie Fonville, by the way, creator of the show, who we knew from Thrilling Adventure Hour, who brought us in for it. Yes. Gary Busey scared the hell out of me because at one point, the surreal nature of what was happening just overtook me. And all I did was crack half a smile. I know that that is against all of the rules of Gary Busey, Pet Judge. It's like between two ferns. The one thing you can't do is break. 
and I half broke and Gary Busey laid into me. Are you laughing in my court? Are you laughing in my court? And then a, in a quiet whisper, there was the most terrifying I think I ever heard, specifically because he whispered and he went, are you laughing in my court? I will put a tomato in your butt. And he threatened, whisper threatened to put a tomato in my butt. Thank goodness Gary Busey has never put a tomato in my butt. But every once in a while, a buddy of mine will text me a picture if he finds a particularly large tomato, knowing that story, <laughs> just as a threat, just to remind me that Gary Busey is looking out for my tomato, my tomatoless butt. Still at large. Yeah. My worry right now is everyone's Googling Gary Busey pet judge and not gonna listen to the rest. But <laughs> just hold <laughs> off. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll tell you, it's it's worth every second. It's on Pluto. Mm. And IMDb, it only says there's one episode, but there's six. Oh, there's yeah. six. And if you go to Pluto, they're all there. And it opens up. It's magic. It's like the opening <laughs> is like it's dark. And it's like a silhouette of Gary Busey. Oh. And then it just, and then it opened and then it's fully lit on Gary Busey with all those teeth. And he just goes, pet justice. Yeah. You know, like with his gavel. <laughs> and he makes people call him judge or your honor. I mean... <laughs> I also love Ian Abramson, who was the standing outside the courtroom guy, oh, who is the absolute best at just bonkers absurdity with a straight face. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we had to retake that a million times because at that point I was laughing like crazy. <laughs> Usually when you dig something like this up, there's like not much left of it. There aren't, there are mm -hmm. remnants. There's a mm -hmm. website still. It's full. It's a, <laughs> each yeah. year across the country, there are thousands of pet disputes. Unfortunately for everyone in the country, <laughs> Gary was only able to bring justice to six. <laughs> Definitely worth checking out. Oh, jeez. He should go on tour. Just dispute all of the pet uh, problems across the country. Uh, can you imagine the, what it would take to tour him? Around? I mean, look, I had no personal experience with him, but it seemed like he, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the laundry list of things he is dealing with. Mm -hmm. I know he's dealt with a lot, but he is, uh, he's definitely like, it's not just let's get in a car and go. No, that's the sense I get. Like there, <laughs> there are a couple, maybe a couple trucks. There's a team that follows just for him. The man was Buddy Holly. Give him some yeah. respect. He oh, I'm sure for Joshua. No, not, I don't mean, I just meant the world. I didn't mean you guys. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> oh, I'll tell you this, though, knowing that that is on Pluto now makes me very happy because Pluto is partnered with Big Screen in VR. So you can watch Gary Busey Pet Judge on a spaceship, which makes me very happy. <laughs> That's amazing. That oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the Lord intended. Exactly. Oh, we could go on about Gary Busey for hours, I'm sure. <laughs> the... <laughs> oh, man. You guys have done a lot of cool stuff. So, Hal, you were the Green Goblin, and Mark, you're Batman. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was uh, those were fun gigs. How does it feel to be Batman? I mean, I'm sure it's great to be the Green Goblin, but you're Batman, man. When the when my agent called, when I got the job, <laughs> my agent called, and the first thing that she said was, "Are you sitting down?" And I was like, "What is about to happen?" And she went, "You're Batman," and that was very very cool. It was a really fun series to do. Robin was in my ear, and it was Michael Center Nicholas, who was also from Thrilling Adventure Hour, a friend that we knew also through uh, Venture Brothers, who directed the whole series. So uh, he cast me as Batman and it was dream role. I now have so much Batman gear because of it. Just was like, here now, it, 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 Batman magnets and Batman socks. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was very excited that I was Batman. And every gift for like a year after that was something Batman themed. I bet she loved it. She was probably bragging about that. Oh, yeah. I was banging I'm, Batman. I was like, I'm, I'm Vicky Vale. <laughs> That's what she called herself. <laughs> Green Goblin's cool too, Hal. You guys do everything I wish I had grown up to do. <laughs> it's weird to play something that a lot of people have played before because the instinct is to do everybody else's version. Mm -hmm. um, I did a year ago, I did MODOK for, for this Marvel podcast. And that was like, like Patton was doing it at the time because his TV show was on. There are a couple people who have done different versions of it, but it was like an opportunity to go, okay, I know this is a comedy podcast. Let me just be completely unhinged. And we, we were recording over Zoom with a bunch of us in there. And I, I think I jump scared the director because she <laughs> heard it. She went, wasn't expecting that. Yeah. It's just like bad guys are the most fun to play. 
They're the most yeah, fun. as a villain, isn't that what you want? Like you want to, if you're, yeah. if you can jump scare your director, you're doing something right. <laughs> well, also every impulse that you have that you don't do, if you're a decent person, you mm-hmm. get to explore some version of that when you play a bad guy. It almost makes it easier to inhabit because it's, it's something you've, that maybe has crossed your mind or you've thought about or observed somewhere else, but haven't inhabited. So that there's like a, I have like a discomfort when something's closer to me. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, is this is this how I hold my hands? Is this what I sound like? But to play a villain is like, oh, yeah, oh. That, that'd be really fun <laughs> to to play in that sandbox for a while to imagine that you're living off of those impulses. How as your comedy partner, it kind of scares me a little that you refer to your motivations in playing mm-hmm. a villain as, yeah, and they crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah, I've murdered you like 12 <laughs> times in your sleep. In my mind, I would never do it. Oh, wait, huh? I would oh, he's got a package at the door. Okay, Where's Mark? his package? Yeah. <laughs> don't do it, Mark. Don't you don't you signal him. <laughs> don't you signal him. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I don't know why I did harmonica hands for that. So you mentioned with Gary Busey that improv, a lot of uh, the improv involved. You both came up through multiple places. Like mm-hmm. se- both of you were in Second City, National Lampoon. Mark, but uh, the Groundlings, Hal, Improv Olympics. When did you guys kind of go into improv and kind of start to convert all this into your day job? Yeah. Well, we met at Second City. We, 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 we met, met at the next stage. We met at the, on, did we on meet, was that the Rea Boulevard? That's above right. Above Malone's ice cream. We did it a was show he, for about three people. You came to see a show. Oh, I came, no, I came to see I you in doing. that show. With the line Flintstein's Jewable Vitamins in it is all yeah. I remember from that show was that line. <laughs> and it was just us improvising. It was me, Eric Edelstein, and I cannot remember the third person's name, but he was your, you were like roommates with him in college. Uh, Rob Adler. Rob Adler. Yeah. I think Rob Adler. I think it was. Like I was roommates with him at the time. I was, I, I say roommates generously. I was crashing on his couch. That counts. In yeah. College. That counts. That counts as roommates, right? No, no, no. Yeah, at that's the time, common law. Contemporaneously to this. Oh, that's also common law. Yeah. But But we really started working that like I came to see the show and that was where we met. So funny. It was so long ago. I forgot that was actually our our first meeting. But we got to working together at Second City back when it was on Melrose in West Hollywood. And it was great because we had the little pathway that went through to the bar and restaurant for the improv up front. Mm -hmm. It was such a sacred space, that theater. And I we did a ton of stuff back there. Yeah. And we'd known each other. We'd been, I mean, at that point, we'd known each other for, I don't know, two, three years. Mm -hmm. So we sort of like circled around one another. I had gone through Second City, Los Angeles. I was done in 2003, which is probably about when you were starting. Yeah. You were senior Uh, when I was a freshman. You gave me those wedgies. You put me in that locker, the backstage locker. And guys like um, Derek Waters had graduated just before me. Mm -hmm. So those were the guys that I looked up to, all those those guys that did that show, Ha Ha Fresh, all of whom have gone on, like Craig Anstead, all these guys have gone on to do really great stuff. But yeah, that's how long we've been improvising together. I've probably Mm -hmm. been improvising since 1994. Yeah. Every kid in high school, when Whose Line Is It Anyway came to America, watched it and said, that's, I want to do that. I'm the weird kid who loves that. Oh, yeah. It was just a small group of us figuring out how to like, all right, how do they do those games? How can we do it? Who will let us perform in front of them any chance we get? And then going to college, getting involved in improv there and having somebody. I went to Syracuse and there's a professional theater attached to the drama school. And somebody who was coming through doing a show had gone through the conservatory in Chicago at Second City. And all I wanted to do was like learn at his feet so that I could go to Chicago and I could go through and be on the main stage and do all that stuff. Like that was the goal was to figure out how to make improvising what I did forever. Yeah. So what happened? He's doing it failure. forever, <laughs> ever, ever. <laughs> you know, it's weird. Like you, I think you always adjust your goals, right? Like a lot of it is, especially when you're younger, is you don't know what you don't know. So you just mm-hmm. assume like, what is the highest goal I can set? I'm going to do that and I'll do it in five years because I have no sense of, of what it takes, of what the environment's like. How many other people are doing the same thing? Yeah. So once you come out to L.A., it's like, well, I just want to work. And improvising is a key to that because it's important to train everywhere, but you also use it all the time. So even if you're not improvising, if you're not touring with Colin Mockery, you're still using it all the time, just in a different way. I opened for Colin Mockery once. No kidding. I sure would. Yeah, I I do stand up. I don't do improv. Yeah. Were they doing an improv duo? 
Yeah, they did a two man, and like so cool. it was one of the coolest moments of my life because I did the opening and it was huge. It was like at our, uh, it was a stadium, so it was like fifteen hundred people in this one little area. But then they called one of my jokes back, and oh, when they were yeah. doing it, oh, and like wow. to me that was like that was the greatest moment. One because it meant they were listening, also. But two, I mean, just to do that, I was just like, that was just like, that became like my greatest moment. <laughs> it's such a great magic trick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Improvising. It's such a specific, cool, fun game to play. I like Hal was also super into Second City Chicago and I would go, I went to school in Chicago. So after class, we would go down because it was the end of the 90s. We would rollerblade to Second City. And uh, <laughs> that was when it was Dratch and Faye and Adsit and... Jagodowski and Kakowski. That was where I first saw Craig. Like just all of these great improvisers down there. Improv was what pulled me into the theme park world, which is where I, the blue collar acting world where I lived for a long time and still live. But I got hired originally doing a short form show at Disneyland based on having been at Second City on Melrose, just seeing a flyer hanging on the wall there. Didn't you play the genie there? Uh, I did, but I wasn't improvising as the genie. That was actually more akin to stand-up, I think. That was in a like in a theater, proper theater. This was a, this was a show called The Department of Untapped Hilarity, or Duh, and we were on one of the outdoor stages, and we dressed like the Best Buy Geek Squad. That was where I met all of the Super Ego guys. We, they were all doing that show back then. Gail Brennan, who still plays my wife at Universal Studios, like met, met a great crew of people over there doing that. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break. Have to hide all the tomatoes. But I do want to thank everyone for the support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my wonderful conversation with Hal and Mark. I'm about to blow their minds with a Second City story of my very own. And we're back. We used to go to Second City Chicago all the time mm -hmm. for our fraternity outings. And I saw the year before we went on Saturday Night Live, I saw Chris Farley and Tim Meadows. Holy oh, wow. cow. You saw Farley at Second City? Wow. Yeah. And he was doing, he did this skit called Whale Boy which my friends and I, we talked about for decades. And then I had Rose Abdu on the show and she was talking about how she was there at the same time. So I, I was like, oh, do you remember this skit? And she's like, oh my God. And so she got, to, she gave me like all the background of the skit and stuff like that. It was that. that's <laughs> so cool. That's so like cool. seeing, that's like seeing the stones in 61 at a bar. Yeah. Or the Beatles <laughs> in the cavern. Yeah. Right. It was something. I mean, it stuck with us forever. It really did. It was, a great uh, show will do that, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was so fun. So fun. Oh, good times. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So all that improv, I always wish I had done it because I know, like, they had it in Detroit for a while. Second City came mm -hmm. to Detroit and Keegan yeah. Michael Key was there. Yeah. Maybe you've heard of him. Yeah. Mark M. Jackson him, was but there. But I was like, oh, he could would have been there if I had the guts to maybe go. Yeah. Uh, Jackson Keegan, the Funks, Josh and Naima, they came out of yeah. Detroit. Larry Angela Joe Campbell. Was Detroit was a great hop in second city spot. Yeah. Angel and Francis both, I think. Yeah. We're a good town. A lot, oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of good comedy here. And rock. Comedy, the, rock, um... and Shinola. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And Moxie, right? Yes, yes, yes. And that pizza. What else is great about Detroit? Coney's? Coney, oh, Coney Island. Kwame yeah. Kilpatrick. <laughs> cool grants. <laughs> so much. So much. So much goodness. <laughs> All right. So you guys start working together. Oh, wait, Hal, I wanted to tell you something. I found this video I thought was the funniest thing that you did. The uh -oh. tree acting coach. Oh. Uh, for the Will Wheaton project. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. <laughs> I just seen Guardians 3, so it was like. It would have been funny anyway, but sure. it was extra funny because I had just seen Groot <laughs> on the big screen. So like it tied it in, right? Oh, that was really funny. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was really good. That was uh the great Josh Kagan wrote that. So we shot like stuff in there in the writer's offices for the show. And then he was just like, go improvise with the tree. And again, that's like improv that's just having that training of like when somebody says, Here, just go do something, you can jump in and do it. It was so much fun and super, it was so hot. And I was so fat and wearing so much clothing, but I love doing it. I haven't seen this yet. I got to see this. When'd you do this? Um, gosh, 2015, 2014. Oh, right on. It was around. It was Guardians whenever the came. Will Wheaton project was on. So yeah. it's been, yeah, it's been a bit so funny. Oh, you know what else is so funny? Drunk history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
That is all Derek's Derek's genius. That's like one of the funniest shows ever. How was doing those, being part of that? It was great. It was one of those things that it began, like it was the very first one happened on my couch because uh, Derek had come over. You know, we had gotten to know each other through Second City and with through our buddy Eric Edelstein. Derek had this idea for, you know, he was a history buff like I was and Jake Johnson as well. And one night Jake got drunk and told a story. Derek is better at telling this part of the story than I am. But Jake got drunk and told a story about Otis Redding at a bar one night. And it gave Derek the idea of like the History Channel. You know, you get somebody like H.W. Brands to tell a story and then actors are reenacting it. So he came up with the idea, told me about it and came over one night and brought a bottle of scotch. And the very first one was about Alexander Hamilton, because that was the episode of American Experience that happened to be on PBS that week, because it was right when the Chernow book came out. So that was everybody was talking about Hamilton. There was a lot of Hamilton stuff happening. So I got drunk, told the story. At first, I thought it was a brilliant move that he did not put it on the Internet. He didn't want to put it on the Internet at first. He wanted to build up the underground street cred of it. So he only put it on DVDs and gave it to people, which I thought was so fun that it became like this thing that got passed around. And he was like, just don't put it on the Internet. And then eventually he put it on the Internet once it had gotten enough buzz at the exact moment that everyone that lived in Hollywood that he knew was going back home for the holidays. So it spread across the country really fast too, because people were showing it to their friends in their hometowns. I think it was, he basically set the pattern for making his video blow up, which I thought was really fun. Aside from the fact that it was just a genius idea that he turned into six seasons of television. And he's, he's such a good drunk whisperer that he can just like, you always know you're you're in good hands with him. I never remembered the end of A Drunk History. I shot a bunch of them. I never remembered the end, but I always trusted that he would take care of me. The, and the next day I always said the same thing. I would call him and I'd go, did we get everything we needed? And he would always say, you know, you ask me that every time. And he, every time he was right, we always got what he needed. It seemed as long as you ended up on the floor, it was okay. Always on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> So when you guys are doing it on the couch and mm -hmm. it's underground, when did Comedy Central come into it? It went from, you know, we started with that one. And the fact that he got, you know, so much good buzz for it, he got a lot of celebrities involved early, including Will Ferrell, who got the interest of Comedy Central, or not the interest of Comedy Central, who got the interest of Funny or Die, when Funny or Die had a HBO, a short-lived HBO sketch show, and it became a bit on that. And then Derek put it on Derek and Simon, which was another short-lived sketch show before Comedy Central eventually just picked it up and made it its own series that went longer than either of those sketch shows had, similar to the way The Simpsons appeared first on Tracy Ullman and then got their own thing that uh, that launched them. Or Beavis uh, and Butthead on the Liquid TV. That's right. I loved Liquid Television back in the day, yeah. Isn't that how South Park got started too? Like they just, the little Jesus versus- uh, Yeah, passing oh, it yeah, around in Hollywood. Shorts. Yeah. I think it was VHS back then, too. They were passing VHS tapes of it around. Everyone's yeah. Googling VHS and Gary Buse. Right. right. When I saw him on that couch pulling his shirt over his belly, you know, is my belly showing? He's done <laughs> that in the backseat of my car. I've seen it before. <laughs> I've seen him do that forearm over his eye. I was like, oh, yeah. oh, Mark. Hal seen every drunk version of me in real life <laughs> and still, on TV. I still... I still sometimes to myself, I go, I'm going to love you. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to miss you. So good. <laughs> There's just something so funny about famous people just lip syncing a drunk person. Uh, Oscar winners. Octavia Spencer did one. Like Academy Award winning actor Octavia Spencer. I thought that. Yeah. Derek. Uh, Derek's a genius. And I was lucky to get to be a part of that whole process. If you're listening right now and you've never seen Drunk History, for whatever reason, you got to check it out. Yeah. A lot of homework coming out of this episode. It really Gary is. Gary Busey. Learn about Drunk VHS. History. You were also, Mark, you were the right person to do it. I know you were lucky to be in it, but he was yeah. lucky or smart enough to have you as the drunk because you love history. I do. And you're the best part of it. Like the people having drunk breakdowns is great, but them trying to get through it and get it right. And you're the way you like, even like the button that like, he's on the 10, like the, <laughs> everything you put on it, it wouldn't have been as good as it was without you. Thanks, man. It was a fun experience. My girlfriend at the time, she did not like it because 
I threw up on the couch. I did not throw up on camera, but I threw up on the couch <laughs> and I threw up in the bed. So the two of us slept in sleeping bags on the floor that night. And she was <laughs> not happy with me. How accurate did it need to be? The narration. I wanted it perfect. I wanted it to be exactly what happened in the story. So I would, every time I did it, I got a few weeks to do the studying of the story. And we would always have a phone call with, with the producer, not Derek, but Derek sometimes, but one of the producers of the show, just to make sure I knew the story so that when they came, I would be able to tell it. Like I knew it backwards and forwards. So I would at least kind of know it semi sideways forwards when I was really drunk. But I always, I always kind of overdid it. And frequently the producer, Greg, would be like, Mark, bring it back. This is like two hour story you're telling. We need to narrow this down. Focus on these things. But yeah, I only ever told one lie on that show. One thing that I, that I know to be factually inaccurate. When I said that I was laying on the floor and I said I liked cantaloupe, I do not, in fact, like cantaloupe. Is it possible you've just never had good cantaloupe? I have tried to like cantaloupe. Maybe, you know what, maybe if it was like, if, if I was eating mindfully, I'm trying to do better about mindful eating and like, mm. you know, really taking in the environment and the smells and the way everything feels. And, you know, like really focusing, sort of getting zen about food. If I did that, I would find some benefit to cantaloupe. But if there is literally anything else to eat, that's what I'm going to pick. Is that because it tastes sweet, but also a little bit like a sock? I think so. Yeah. 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 So it's somebody added sugar and lemon to sock tea. And they're like, suck on this. Yeah, exactly. You can actually chew it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going to, I enjoy cantaloupe, but I no. will not disagree with the fact that cantaloupe and honeydew are the green pepper of fruit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> All right. So that's that's really cool. And then you mentioned Alexander Hamilton was the first episode. But yeah. then later, the big coup was they actually got Lynn Manuel to come. That's right. Do it. I was in his living room when that episode happened. Uh, you were there with Lynn I was Manuel? there with Lynn talking, nerding out about Hamilton stories while they were doing the setups because Derek wanted Derek wanted for the DVD extras for the had to have the two of us meet from the very first to the last version and there's some actually there's some easter eggs within his telling of the story that are throwbacks to shots from the very first one that i thought was pretty cool and of course lin manuel knows infinitely more about alexander hamilton than i do and is so fired up to tell you about it so that just as like a super fan of that guy it was one of those really fun things to get to be a part of i loved hercules mulligan was a story that, I, that i'd never heard before and i was like we're talking on the couch and i was like dude Thank you for introducing me to Hercules Mulligan. And he let up. He's like, oh, my God, he's my favorite character. OK, so brrr, and he just is that guy. Like He just rapid fire goes off about Hercules Mulligan. Big fan, big fan of Lynn. I've heard him tell the story where he's like reading that ridiculously thick Alexander. I mean, mm -hmm. who reads that and goes, hmm. <laughs> right. Vacation. Brilliant. <laughs> Guy's got a crazy fast brain. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did you ever see him doing it for the president? But before it was like a thing. Yeah. He did oh, it yeah. for Obama. And they're all like, yes, yes. But in, out of context, I got to believe like they must have thought he was crazy. Yeah. If you don't hear the song, the idea of that. Show, but a lot of the idea of a lot of shows, I think, is crazy. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Like I, an obscure, an obscure 60s movie about a plant. Let's make a Broadway musical about that. That's one of my favorites. Mine I have too. that poster hanging oh, in my it's so room good. downstairs. <laughs> I love, love. I used to have a little Aud Audrey to uh, coin uh, bank, <laughs> like oh. the the little squeezy '80s rubber coin purse. No, it was like it would open up. And uh. it like, oh, you would drop the coin in, and she would eat it. I was just walking the other day, um, doing the dentist song. That was like uh, when I was younger, just a bad little kid. <laughs> do do do. <laughs> My mama noticed funny <laughs> things I did. Do do do. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> I'm going, Jeff. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I'd put if I knew this was going to be it, I would. <laughs> it's all right. Don't cry. Lift up your head. Wash off your mascara. Here, right. take my Kleenex. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, uh, hell, you know, uh, Len Peralta. I, I yes. just, I just kind of met him. I was on uh, the daily tech show. Oh yeah. And I met him. Oh, what a great artist. You kind of do a thing with him or you've done a thing with him. Yeah. I, we, I saw his name and it's like, Oh, yeah, Len Peralta, super talented artist. I got to know him. He did this Geek a Day thing on Kickstarter every year where we do geek trading cards. 
So I got to be one of the geeks one year. So I have a little trading card of me as the Green Lantern, which I love. We were like, let's do something together. What are we going to do? And so we just took suggestions from people for a name. And then I would do like a 60 to 90 second improvised monologue. I would just create a character out of the name. And then he would draw a character based on whatever I was doing. That's so cool. And it was, yeah, yeah, he's so talented. He drew like this mat. Al Jaffe had just died. So he drew Mm. during our show, one of those fold all things, you know, where you kind of, oh yeah, yeah, from the end of, uh, from the back of the mad magazine. Sure. So cool. Those are great. (laughs) Mark, Mm -hmm. I, you did a video with, uh, Mickey Rooney. I met. Yeah. Yeah. I did a video of the hero dog awards for, was the Hallmark channel? It was a award show for dogs. Yeah. You said you met him. I walked up to, he was saying, he was doing a play. I think he was playing the wizard in the wizard of Oz right on. in Michigan. And he walked by and I went up to him and I said, hi, Mr. Rooney. And I shook his hand. Cause I had like this rule that if you don't shake someone's hand, you didn't technically meet them. Uh huh. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't mean like us. Like I wouldn't say, oh no, I never met. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we- <laughs> Look, if the police show up, you're yeah. still allowed to say you've never met us. Right. Yeah. You're good. Those guys. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I didn't shake. Look at my hand. It's clean. Test it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you kind of looked at me and I was just like, I mean, not that anyone has to appreciate me coming up to them, but it's like, you know, hey, I know you're Mickey Rooney, but you're also just an old guy who happens to be standing randomly on in this hotel. And I knew who you were. And I think <laughs> that should have been like, oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? I don't yeah. know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. It would just it seemed more annoying than, oh, thank goodness after. 50 years of since my last movie, someone still recognized yeah. me. Because you know, <laughs> that, that, Dana Carvey had his whole, I was the biggest star in a world, his whole yeah. impression with, yeah. That was actually the bit sort of that they played on this video was that the video was him doing narration for a Rin Tin Tin retrospective, but just constantly making it about himself. But he is a character, man. He said, I remember at lunch, I because he had rolled up in a uh, in a Ford Focus and I thought, you're the biggest star in the world, Mickey. And I asked him, I was like, Mickey, I got to ask. You're the biggest star in the world. I figured you'd roll up in a limousine or a Ferrari or something. And he started laughing. He goes, kid, I've driven Fords my whole life because Henry Ford was a friend of mine. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm talking to a guy who was friends with the, inv- or the, the inventor of the assembly line, the namesake of the car. Like, holy moly, the Henry Ford. So the idea of like, being a uh, like just like a handshake away from uh history to that guy seemed very you know it's like the six degrees of kevin bacon you think of like oh can i link myself to the cast of that 70s show no this is like linking yourself to americana you know right and that's and that's how you kind of know they didn't have canceling back then yeah because like, henry ford was would... like henry uh, you know uh, the, your feelings about the jews yeah. i'm gonna <laughs> Oof. i'm gonna i gotta <laughs> switch i gotta switch yeah <laughs> But also, if he drives Fords, couldn't he have picked a better, like, an edge or... Yeah, right? Well, like, something, an escape, <laughs> even? Something, like, a little bigger that doesn't feel like... No, Ford like Focus, Like, you put a penny man. in the back to make it go. <laughs> Ford Focus, sure. Why yeah. not? He had that big crank that he would take outside and plug it into the yeah, back and... Turn it. Yeah, sure. Get it going. Oh, man. <laughs> you guys did Groundling, Second City, all that. Mm-hmm. Did you guys ever toy with Saturday Night Live or audition or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. I submitted a writer's packet. I never auditioned. I submitted a writer's packet and had no idea what I was doing. Like, you know, you learn the formatting really quickly and then, and then you submit it. And all the ideas were stuff that a younger person in comedy would do, which is like, if I can make it offensive and shocking, that's a laugh rather than like finding something funny in it. Like I feel like at that age, a lot of it is stumbling. Because you don't mm-hmm. really know your point of view yet, but it was a really, it was really exciting. I submitted it with another writer, like we submitted a packet together, and didn't hear anything. But that space where we could have heard something was really exciting because I've been a fan my whole life. Yeah, I auditioned in L.A. at our old second, or no, it was at I.O. at Improv Olympic. Uh, they had a bunch of preliminary rounds, and then I got down to there were twelve of us, and we auditioned for Lorne Michaels. And the most terrified, he happened to sit underneath one of the overhead lights at Second City that light the house. And they did not turn the house lights off. The second I walk on stage, the first thing I see is Lorne Michaels' shock of white hair and him just 
staring intently. And they took six of the 12, and I was not one of them. But it was cool getting close. I'm going to stop watching Saturday Night Live. Yeah, take that. <laughs> <laughs> because you do a lot of cool impressions. I saw like a, your whole reel. You do uh, Colin Farrell. Yeah, eyebrow acting. <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> ordering McDonald's. Oh, my God. That's another good one. Thanks. I, <laughs> everyone's got to find that. That was really good. I mean, but they're, those aren't like common ones. Yeah, I was trying to find stuff because that's the thing about impressions and how you can speak to this too. Like, I'm sure the once somebody does an impression of someone, it's burned. Unless you bring something really different. Exactly. Like everybody does a walk in there. The, it, it has to be like real, real common. Otherwise, yeah. everybody does a bad Al Pacino, but mm -hmm. Bill Hader does a great Ooh, Al Pacino. The correct Al Pacino. That when yeah. I saw him in that Katrina sketch, he's like, I go to learn more. Like everything he... Just that he hears it and nails it. I saw him years and years ago. I used to do a show at IO called the Doug Caro Late Night Explosion. It was like a improvised comedy talk show. Very few people were there in the audience, but there were two guys that did a bit where they were like a two man. They were doing their version of, of who's on first. And then one of them has like a brain aneurysm and, and dies. And the other one out of panic just keeps doing their half and like <laughs> looking at this corpse. But Bill Hader was one of the two guys and he's the only one from second city los angeles to ever make it on snl yeah boy he's but good. he's like the gift it's music really like you find their musical note and start yeah. from there and try and build it out i wish i could do have you ever seen I, always, I would like talk like in voices 24 7 i'd be at restaurants just <laughs> your your outgoing message on your uh cell phone is always a different celebrity it's like you have your own audio cameo <laughs> <laughs> my voicemail growing up was me imitating Billy Crystal, imitating uh, Muhammad Ali and Leon Spinks, you know, from that, that yeah. comedy album. I yes. like your shoes. It was like, how you, how you doing? You know, and like, uh, but it was, a, it was like, at some point it's everyone's just impersonating the person who's doing the one on Saturday Night Live. Normal people like me, that is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's funny. Oh, man. Oh, let's let's talk about your podcast. You got you guys. Please. Well, let's talk about first thrilling adventure hour. Yeah. Tell me about that. This is a uh, kind of a, a throwback an old timing. Yeah, it's been Go going ahead. since, mm -hmm. I, you know, I always feel weird talking about it. And, and here's why is for the last 18 years, I've been feeding off of Mark's table scraps. So thrilling adventure hour starts <laughs> with Ben Acker and Ben Blacker, who are incredibly gifted and talented writers who we're working on all sorts of things at the time and going, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have the actors we know? They did, They had a reading for, they they wrote a pilot for Sparks Nevada, Marshall on Mars. It was actually a character from a Malcolm in the Middle spec that they wrote. And they did this reading and they have all these talented people. They know Paget was there. Uh, you were there. Who was it? Mark Fight that played? It was Holmes Osborne. Oh, Holmes Sparks Osborne. Sparks Nevada. The, the original Sparks yeah. just for that reading. And they were like, we should do a show every month so that we can keep writing and keep and exposing people to our writing. So you were part of the first show. I didn't come on till show, I think, number three or four. Yeah. And I got in because you had to drop out of a sketch show that Ben Acker was writing at Second City that I got cast in. God and bless America. Came to, and it went from like, oh, we're doing this show. We'd love to get you in sometime to me doing that show and going like, I'm not a character guy. I wasn't at the time. I'm just going to do a bunch of characters. And then it was like, come be in it next month and and the rest is history. But it's yeah. it's just a killer lineup and crazy that we've been doing it for, for 18 years. Yeah, since 2005, uh, we first started doing that show. But you, I mean, it's funny. I can't even imagine the era, the pre-HAL era of that because there wasn't really a pre-HAL era. Considering that it's been 18 years, two yeah. months, you know what I mean? Two sure. months of pre-HAL is hilarious, but I still will rub yeah. it in. Look, <laughs> as the senior member. There's entire Facebook groups dedicated to the pre-HAL era. Oh, yeah. yeah that's huge. Exactly. A lot of people love tape trading. It's all very big. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thrilling Adventure Hour was the gig of a lifetime that will always be and has always been my creative family. HAL and I became brothers when we were in that show just month after month for it we every month for a decade and then since then on road gigs and comic cons and all kinds of other you know assorted one-offs we went to australia new zealand for shows down there 
and it was it's just been it's just been an absolute gift in fact we're doing a thrilling adventure hour on the uh, wga strike lines we mm -hmm. have just because we're all we're all still in each other's lives so much even though the show ended we haven't uh, the show ended i say but we have another one coming up in june yeah we keep going i feel like shows that go on that long there are always people that have a falling out or dislike one another mm -hmm. and it's just not it's just never happened with us. This core group has been together for so long and they're, they are family. And maybe part of it is that we only saw each other once a month. So that was something we all looked, that was like the highlight of my month every month oh, yeah. for years, no matter what else was going on. I knew I was going to go see my friends, get to do this incredibly well-written show for a hungry audience that loves it. But the best part of that show was really hanging out backstage and talking to one another. Which is yeah. where our podcast kind of started is like trying to capture that. And like, how do we take that experience and not do just more acting stuff, but just chat to each other? Because I think that's interesting, which is what I love about, yeah. the, about this podcast is like actually having conversations with people and talking to them to me is fascinating. It was terrifying to me when we first started, though, because I had only ever acted except for Drunk History, where I was telling a story that already existed. I'd never as myself, given my opinions about the world in what I deemed to be an amusing or humorous way. And it took Hal pulling it out of me. I am writing Hal's coattails on this show and have now for 400 episodes because I have, I'm still scared of just talking as myself. But he, Hal makes it easy and it's fun to like have. I, that's why I don't do stand up. I need, I need Hal to bounce the ideas off of. I admire you for doing stand up, Jeff, because I, that, that scares the hell out of me. Me too. I tried it in college. I just wasn't brave enough. And I, I stopped yeah. because I'm not because I wasn't good, which I wasn't, but, <laughs> but I was like, I respect this too much. And I yeah. know I'm just trying to, be other comics I've seen rather than figuring out who I am and being personal. I just, I love watching comedy. I love comedians have since I was a kid watched them I, like every HBO special. I had platypus man memorized. I, I loved all that stuff. Yeah. So I just have an immense respect for what you do. Sorry to interrupt, but if you need to take a moment and go find your own Hal, go do that real quick. And we're back. We're going to dive deeper into comedy and Mark and Hal's podcast coming up and we're back. It's funny when I talk with improvisers, because I think the exact thing that scares you from doing stand up or me from doing improv is kind of almost the same thing. Like it, it doesn't process to me when you go, oh, I'm scared of, why would you be scared of doing something where you knew what you were going to say and do? You yeah. think it's more comforting to go up and have no idea what's going to come out of your mouth for 45 minutes, but you happen to have some people next to you to kind of help. To me, that's just like, oh my God, like to me, that's a nightmare. I was like, oh my God. Well, I think to me, it's, I never know, or part of it, I guess for me is I never know what an audience is going to laugh at, but I know what I laugh at and I know what Hal laughs at. So I'm going to try to make Hal laugh. Or if I'm in an improv group, I know collectively what our group laughs at. So I'm going to try. It's, I think it zeroes the focus in for me. You know what I mean? I just have, we're, we're doing a We Got This episode. I just have to make Hal laugh. Yeah. Got it. No, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. I also think when you're improvising, you get a lot more grace from the audience because yeah. they know you didn't write anything. You know, the, maybe the best or a classic compliment would be like, you didn't write any of that? You sure? Because it, when it's done well, it feels written. But even then, it might not be as good as the best written, you know, the greatest improvised, improvised scene may not be as good as the greatest written scene because you have the time to plan it out and do everything. But the flip side of that is there's an element of the audience that that's just a little bit like leaning back, crossed arms, like, all right, well, let's see what this person wrote rather yeah. than like, we're all in improv. Everybody's working without a net because the audience has no idea what's going to happen. I'm not 100% sure that the people in the audience know the comedians wrote it ahead of time. There, I mean, if you see somebody like Brody Stevens doing crowd work, he's the goat of that. And none of that was written, but because it's all just, you know, riffing on. But that again, that's a conversation. That's a relationship. But yeah, I mean, do you get that when you do stand up shows like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you just went off on this topic. Like, yeah, I, no, no, it's in a it's in a notebook. It's rehearsed. I know I've done that before. 
I said something to a guy I was working with the person, he brought someone on stage. They said something. And what he said was so funny. I couldn't believe how fast he came back with it. And I said to him after I said, Tim, how did you think of that so fast? He goes, I didn't that time. <laughs> the first time I did, but not that time. Yeah. <laughs> Put stuff in the hopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's only the first time for the audience. I'll be saving you for later. Yeah. I, you know, like I remember seeing people and like, it doesn't click. I think until you see someone do it twice. Yeah. Like if you see the same person do the same thing twice then you're like, Oh, you know, that, that was prepared. But I think sometimes it's like going to the theater for some of these folks. Like to us, we live in that world. Yeah. Right. Whether it be improv or that. So like, we know, we know oh, that guy, he just wrote that or he he's been doing that for two years, but these people, some of these people show up and they've never even been to a comedy club. They just assume this is it. <laughs> and then they leave. And that's that magic trick thing, I think, yeah. too. You know, yeah. once you know the magic yeah. trick and the mechanics of it, then you can fine tune it and craft it, whether that's fine tuning a stand up act or honing your improv skills so that you can jump up at any moment and play any game. But if you don't know that, it really is. It looks like magic. And that's why stand up to me still looks like magic. Right. Well, that's that's the goal of doing stand up. The people that I always looked at and admired and tried to emulate were the ones that made it look like they were just making it up. Yeah. It's like it's almost like someone was explaining like an acting technique to me where you let kind of take the words in, but you just let them come out. Mm -hmm. You don't like act them. And like to me, like that's the stand up. You know, when you're doing it, it's like you know the words. <laughs> yeah. I like I you don't over prepare it. It's like, and then it, you just do it naturally so that you have that thing where you're feeling like you're making Hal laugh or but you're doing it for the audience. Yeah. And so yeah. I saw George Carlin in 1997, and I would have sworn before that there was at least some improvised element to seeing him live, but he just did his album. Whatever album had come out, I don't know if it's You're All Diseased or, or whatever it was that had just come out, but he did it to a T. It was so tightly put together, you know, watching more about his process. That makes a lot of sense. But like he had one unscripted moment in the whole thing where he got tangled in his mic wire. And it was like 15 seconds, got a laugh, and then right back in. So it's, and it, but it still feel, if you hadn't heard the album, then you would think this was all coming off the top of his head, just the way he followed and the way he built. But it was, so, it's like so tightly choreographed. And then you watch Robin Williams, who is off the wall and getting non sequitur to himself all over the place. And they're equally brilliant, even. It's such an incredible art form for that reason. Absolutely. Yeah. But really, it just is. It's just you have X amount of minutes on a bare stage with an audience. Make them yeah. laugh. At its core, that's all it is. And that's some people do it with a guitar. Some people do it with a puppet. Some people do it extemporaneously. Some people do it with well-crafted words that they've memorized 55 minutes of. Whatever it is, you know? To me, I'm sure it's the same for improv. There's nothing greater in the world than making strangers laugh. Oh, like yeah. just making them laugh. And I don't know if you guys ever make yourselves laugh on stage. Some you say, I imagine with improv, I would like, so sometimes if I ever slipped and just said something off the cuff, I could make myself laugh. Yeah. That's actually how I found out I had a bald spot. <laughs> <laughs> I was recording myself and there's like, there's nobody there. It's like a fundraiser though. So it's depressing. And there's people I'm like, what'd you raise money for a cat? And then I laughed or something. And like, I leaned over and the camera catches the top of my head. And I said to my wife, when did, who's going to tell me? I have no hair right here. <laughs> and she's like, we were afraid to tell you. Because I was the guy that had no forehead in high school. You know, like I had the mullet, you know, like it was mm -hmm. just huge in the front and the back. And, but it's nowhere where I can see it in a mirror. That was yeah. the only time I had seen it. And I was like, anyway, so that's why you shouldn't make yourself laugh. Speaking <laughs> of laughing, yeah, we got this with Mark and Hal. Yeah. Right? And we started to kind of go into it. So this is... It's such a great podcast. Thanks. You guys pick like um, some kind of uh, debate and mm -hmm. then you solve the debate. Yeah. Important stuff like best salad. Yeah. <laughs> best side dish for pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, I dug that was I was listening to the one just recently. Also, uh, Alien versus Aliens, which was uh, quite a debate. It was. It was an intense debate. Yeah. Hal came up with the premise for this when we were backstage at Thrilling Adventure. I, like you said, you know, we're just shooting the breeze backstage and we would get into dumb debates about things. And he said, let's do this as a podcast since Thrilling Adventure Hour is ending its 10 year run. 
and we started doing it with our first episode, which was, should you put ketchup on a hot dog? And I thought, can we do 50 minutes of this? And turns out, yeah, uh, we can get in the weeds. As you are about to find out, spoiler, coming soon, we've got a special episode coming up. It's fun to get people on who think they don't have an opinion about something, and then it turns out they do very much have an opinion about it and get really animated. You got me kind of spiling right now on this ketchup thing on a hot dog. I mean, only like a heathen or a six-year-old should be allowed to do yeah. that. Yeah. Barack Obama's uh, response when asked by Anthony Bourdain, I believe it was, should you put ketchup on a hot dog? He went, yep, if you're six. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. But that's like the stuff you immediately have a feeling about it, right? And if we were all hanging out in a bar or over dinner, we could probably sit and talk about it for for half hour, 45 minutes, just just like going off on it one way or the other. Yeah. So to take that and be like, all right, Mark and I are, we're the Supreme Court of dumb things. So we're not necessarily, we wind up sometimes on the opposite side, but we're trying to work together to to settle it. Once and for all, for all time. But we have ones like Aliens, aliens versus alien where we get really like it's not as it's not as heavy on the comedy but it's a lot of like we both feel really passionate passionately about it and these are movies we enjoy and my absolute favorites are are just the off the wall we did one that was liquid soap bar soap or foam soap that is maybe like 40 40 45 minutes of just complete lunacy because we're just you learn a lot about us and we make fun of ourselves and the idea of what we're doing, so not taking any of it seriously, but also taking it intensely seriously. Yeah. Somehow it works. That's the tongue planted firmly in cheek. No, but it's great because, you know, once you start to, like, recognize why do we do certain things, then you start to realize, oh, I was uh, I've programmed to kind of just think that way. And you, if you start to reverse it a little bit, you can start to have real, real opinions. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Everyone. Go, you got this is what you got to do. You got to go check out We Got This with Mark and Hal. It's on Apple, it's everywhere. Wherever you're listening to this, you can find that. And uh, I promise you, that's a great, great, great listen. You got to go check out Gary BC Pet, Pet, Pet Judge. Judge. Gary BC Pet Judge. <laughs> yeah. And Drunk History, if you've never seen it. And Drunk yeah. History. So there's so much, so much to do. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. This was so fun. Oh, this was a treat. Thank oh, you for having us. Thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you for having us. I thank forgot you. which wow. podcast I was on. It's fine. Listen, I'm well. Wow, Hal uh, has just commandeered your show. Did my you brain hear is that? very sick. Thanks for Thanks coming, for coming on, on my show, <laughs> Jeff. I'll take it from here. Thanks for coming really on to appreciate. Classic Conversations, starring Hal so, Lublin. I record so many podcast episodes in a week. I'm just used to when I see a face in Zoom that isn't somebody I normally record with. I just say, hey, "Thanks for coming on." And, you're I like, and they're like, you. "I'm your better help therapist." What do you yeah. mean? Thanks for coming on. <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's been great being here. I appreciate you having me on my show. It's uh, it's everything I heard it was. Yeah. Uh, so. I wanted to talk to you about processing the death of your mother, and then you asked me what kind of hostess cakes I like. We, we still have to charge you for this. You understand that, right? Anyway, thanks for coming on. Oh God. Up next in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, that was so fun, dude. All right. How awesome was Hal Lublin and Mark Gagliardi? Definitely check out We Got This with Mark and Hal, maybe specifically episode 429 with guest Jeff Duoskin, where we talk about best TV car. I hear that's a very good episode to start with. So check that out. Loved hanging with Hal and Mark. So many great stories. Oh, man. Go check out Gary Busey, Pet Judge as well, and Drunk History if you haven't seen that. So much goodness, so much homework. I know you're going to be busy after you hit stop here. Anyway, uh, well, with the interview over, it can only mean one thing. I know, the interview's over, the episode's over. Can't believe it myself. Huge thank you to my guests and new pals, Hal Lublin and Mark Gagliardi. And a huge thanks to Rose for hooking us up. And a huge thanks to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. 
Thanks in advance for spreading the word. And we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.